And here we are. Okay, thank you everyone for coming. We are ready to broadcast our next uh, webinar. So this is the application development uh, virtual group meeting. And today we are going to have really interesting stuff uh, to, um, to discuss. So who we are, the application development virtual group is just, uh, as the name implies, a virtual group uh, affiliated with the PASS organization uh, that tries to uh, give help to all developers uh, to get free training and information to all application developers, as I said, uh, working on the entire Microsoft Data Platform. This is a big change from the last year when we were more focused on SQL Server and relational databases. So from this year and on, uh, we restarted the user group with a much broader scope. So not only SQL Server, but as I said before, the entire data platform. So a huge amount of uh, uh, cool technology to discuss. And since this is not enough, we also uh, like to uh, increase uh, the, the scope of uh, the technology uh, also in terms of uh, um, languages. So again, uh, on Azure, all languages are welcome. So not only .NET, Python, Ruby, Java, whatever. And of course, this is also true for us. So uh, what I'm trying to do is also for the next uh, um, for the next webinar to try to uh, talk about Python or Java or Scala or anything that can talk with uh, Azure and any of the nice uh, data related features we have we have there. Uh, as I said before, we are affiliated with PASS. Uh, I just uh, uh, recommend you to go to the website, discover what the PASS is. It's uh, just a big, huge organization. Start with SQL Server, but now focused on the entire Microsoft Data Platform. Uh, registration is free, and you can follow uh, all the news uh, on the website or the usual social media. The virtual user group are just user group that meets online to help uh, to connect everyone from any part of the world on specific technologies or using specific languages. We are the application development user group, but there are user group for almost everything, data architecture, performance, virtualization, and also in, in different languages. So you can just pick the, the one you are most confident with or more interested with. And the next meeting uh, will be on T-SQL Windows Function, a very useful uh, uh, developer uh, feature for developers. Uh, Itzik Bengan will, uh, will show us how we can leverage it. But now let's move to today's meeting. And today's meeting is on a really, I wouldn't say new, but surely changed uh, uh, lately uh, uh, technology, really cool, called the Cosmos DB. It's a NoSQL database. Actually, it's much more than that, as Danny will uh, will 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 show us, uh, and uh, and Danny Lee, which is the principal manager of the product, uh, will uh, will show anything that we may want to learn about this uh, product uh, so that we can start uh, using it immediately. Right, Danny? Absolutely. Uh, I just want to make sure you're hearing me okay, correct? Yeah, I can hear you perfectly. Uh, if everyone needs to uh, communicate with us, uh, for example, for telling us that you cannot hear us, uh, just use the question or, and I will answer you. Perfect. So, Danny, you are presenter now. Excellent. Well, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Danny Lee. Thank you very much, uh, David, for this uh, awesome introduction. Um, yes, so some of you um, might have actually known me from the past. I used to be part of the SQL customer advisory team uh, to talk about data warehousing and BI. So for those who are in app dev pass, uh, you might know me from then. Um, I actually uh, am a Spark and Cosmos DB guy. And so today I'm here to talk about the awesomeness of Azure Cosmos DB. Um, and so we will try to make this as interactive as we can. So please post questions so David can post them to me as well. Um, but we are the industry's first globally distributed multi-model database service, which is awesome. And so I'm going to skip the, the standard marketing stuff. I'm going to go right into the system itself. And there are going to be some demos as well. So just bear with me as I you know, debate with PowerPoint these days. Um, the, the focus of Cosmos TV is to help you build globally distributed applications. Um, the focus is that stateful systems, stateful data is actually hard. Georeplication of that is even harder. Um, you need concepts like elasticity of computer and storage. You need 
fast, super responsive, millisecond latency when it comes to read and write, and you need the system to be durable, consistent, and highly available. So this is what Cosmos DB provides to you. So for a lot of these new modern applications, you're going to be able to utilize us to actually support building them. And what do I mean by that? Um, what sets us apart basically is the fact that, number one, we are globally distributed from the ground up. That means we have a worldwide presence. And what I mean by that literally is every single Azure data center that exists, we are a ring zero service. That means they will spin up Cosmos DB within any region that Azure has a data center in. Uh, we also are even as well in uh, the various government cloud uh, environments as well. Um, what's really cool is this concept of automatic multi-region replication. I'm actually going to show you that a little bit in, in, um, uh, in a second, actually, um, with manual and automatic failovers. But the, I, the, the key concept with this is that you've got latency, throughput, consistency, and availability guarantees. We are the first service to provide all to provide SLAs on all four of these uh, facets. And so let me just jump right into the portal. Uh, give me a second here. Uh, and let me show you what I'm talking about. So this is the Azure portal, and I'm looking at um, one of my services, uh, Doctor Who uh, database. Uh, for those who are geeks, you can sort of reference that. Um, and in order for me to see what regions I have, You'll notice that all the little hexagon boxes are all the different Azure regions, and these are the regions that I already have replicated the data to. And so let me go ahead and click on, uh, in this case, um, replicate data globally under settings. And when I do this, what you'll notice right away is that uh, I have a one central write region for this database, which is central U.S., and I have multiple read regions, which is Southeast Asia, Brazil South, West India, and so forth and so forth. If I want to remove a region or if I want to add a region, all I need to do is to click a button. Uh, this is also available in the SDKs themselves, by the way, so you could do this programmatically. But now I've decided that I'm going to remove East Asia as one of my read regions. I click on Save, and... Voila, that's it. Then I have either updated the system to add a region or remove region. In this case, I'm showing you remove, but it's the same process to add a region as well. And what this does is it means that whenever I do an insertion into Cosmos DB, that data will automatically be replicated to all these other read regions automatically as well. So any new data that goes into my primary write region will automatically be replicated into any of these other read regions. This is really important because when you're looking at how customers are working with data, especially for things like mobile games, right, where latency is really important, they, the data needs to be physically residing where they are. And so let me go ahead and actually show you, um, this is an old school Node.js demo, but the reason I'm actually showing you this Node.js um, from the command line uh, demo is just because that sort of showcases the fact that we have four different SDKs. In addition to .NET and Java, you also have Python and um, Node.js. And so let's just go to the Node.js version. Oh, sorry, that's not the one I wanted. Here we go, perfect. So I'm going to log into one of my VMs. It is, a, um, it is okay, give me a second. Uh, it is located here in central U.S., and I'm going to, let's see. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and take a look at uh, Node.js code. Okay, so for those folks here, you're going, really, are you making me look at the code? Well, the co only part of the code that I'm really making you look at right now is that I have... Uh, different connection preferred locations. So I'm going to go ahead and actually uncomment the worst scenario possible, okay? And in this case, I'm saying my preferred locations is I want to hit Southeast Asia, West Europe, Central Canada, West US, and East US too. In other words, if a region was to ever go down for some reason, I will then go in the order that I've listed. My application will basically hit each one of these regions in that order to try to get the data that I need, okay? And so these regions are the same regions that we're showing you here uh, on this particular portal page. So I'm going to go ahead and run this little test. And what you'll notice with this test basically is um, 
Okay, there we go. Um, is that it's just simply running a simple select query from uh, the Node.js to Cosmos DB, uh, and it's returning to me the time it takes for it to to uh, to come back. Sorry, looks like the there we go. Okay, sorry about that. Sorry about that. Apparently, I have the caps lock on. So let's try this again. There we go. Okay. So because I was very silly, I decided to go ahead and try to connect to Southeast Asia, and my VM is located in Central U.S. You know, notice that the latency is actually pretty horrible. Uh, it takes actually a round trip of 211 milliseconds to go from my VM that's just sitting in Central U.S to um, the first preferred region that I listed, which was Southeast Asia. So that, yeah, that's the basically the round trip between uh, going uh, within the, the Azure data centers to go from, well, Central US to Southeast Asia and back. And so let's change this code to actually say, no, no, no that was very, very silly of me. Uh, why would I do that? Let me just change, uh, uncomment one line and, uh, Comment and uh, comment one line and uncomment the other one. And there we go. And so this one, I'm actually a lot smarter. I'm saying, let me go ahead and list Central US as the first one I'm going to go access, and then East US two, and so forth and so forth. Okay. So now I'm going to go do that. Now that I've saved it, I'm going to run the exact same test. That there's nothing else that I've done, but I mean, because I have data sitting in Central US, you notice it just went from 211 milliseconds down to five to six milliseconds, just like that. Okay, and that's more or less the point about these modern applications that you're going to need to actually have super low latencies. And import, just as important, the, we have these are guaranteed SLAs. So in other words, when you go ahead and access the system, we will actually ensure have an SLA that 99.99% of the time the data will have the availability that's required or the latency requirements such that it's the reads are less than 10 milliseconds and the writes are less than 15 milliseconds. So we, and, and if we don't hit those 99%, 0.99% of the time, we actually owe you money, okay? So we, this is the type of environment that we've set up so we can, you can feel comfortable knowing that our environment's here for you, okay? So uh, just jumping right back to the slides here, uh, okay? Oh, there we go. This is the context we're talking about, global distribution. So that way you can build these applications and very easily have the data spread to the locations that you have your users and you have your applications. Okay? Uh, related to exactly what you just saw about the guaranteed low latency, right? We have globally distributed with reads and writes served from your local region. We have a write optimized latch-free database engine that's designed for SSD. So the underlying infrastructure for us to be able to write the sheer volume of random writes to the system is actually, we are able to do it because we have uh, put a lot of stuff directly into memory, but we also put a lot of stuff directly into SSDs. Um, synchronous and automatic indexing at sustained ingestion rates. The, the call out here is that because of the way Cosmos DB is designed, we automatically index everything that comes in. So you have this JSON document, it's inserted into our environment. Not only do you have the partition key that we actually will automatically hash the data and automatically distribute the data across to all the different partitions inside your, uh, inside your um, database collection, but in addition to that, more importantly, is that every single attribute that exists inside that JSON document is automatic indexed. So that way you will have, we, that's why we can give you those guaranteed SLAs in terms of query performance, because we can uh, easily fan out, find the data that you need and send it right back to you. And hence the reason we're saying single digit millisecond latency at any scale. Uh, while uh, we give you the 99% guaranteed reads and writes are less than 10 milliseconds and 15 milliseconds respectively, on average, uh, especially when you're using direct, which means that you are connected directly to the data partitions, uh, on average, we're actually saying one mil less than one millisecond reads and less than six millisecond writes. And so another important aspect of this is the ability to scale throughput and storage 
virtually independently because the amount of data you have may or may not have anything to do with the amount of throughput you need. And so in the case on the storage side of things, you're paying per gigabyte used, okay? There's no partition management, no limits. Already noted the automatically indexing, the global distribution. Another cool aspect of it also is that we have automatic expiration via TTL. TTL stands for time to live. And what we mean by that is that when you insert data into it, you can actually specify how long is this document supposed to stay inside Do uh, Cosmos DB. And after that period in time, it will automatically be deleted from Cosmos DB. So if you have short-lived session-based systems like uh, access key tokens or things of that nature, you would basically put in a TTL right from the get-go. So that way it, the, the token or that uh, document associated with that token gets expired. So that way then the token will be no longer usable. We actually have a couple really cool demos on how to get Xamarin uh, from basically the, the mobile framework platform, uh, how it interacts with Cosmos DB in order to be able to ser uh, service up uh, hundreds of thousands of millions of users. So really cool on that front. But just as important, if not in some cases more important, elastically scalable throughput. And I'm going to show you a demo on this real quick, but the, the key concepts of this, you pay by the hour for only what you need. Okay? There's no partition management, no limits, and again, I'm going to show you that demo in, the, in a second on this one. Uh, you change throughput at any time, and it's effective in seconds. And so what we mean is, if you look at this sort of this map here, is that at 9 p.m. Pacific, you're probably going to need more throughput on the West Coast and uh, Arizona, and but you're probably going to need uh, a lot less throughput uh, in uh, Central U.S. But then the the, the uh, uh, witching hour kicks in, and then all of a sudden you need less throughput on the West Coast U.S., but you need more throughput on Central U.S. And, and this is globally. Okay, this is not just specific to the U.S., obviously. This is any anywhere that we have a region, we can see where basically you're going to have more throughput uh, in one area and less throughput in another. So you can set up and design and configure your system so that way you can ensure that you have the throughput in the regions that you actually need that. Okay. And another extremely important concept is that we ju uh, uh, we recently announced our support for request per minute, and the the this context of request per minute is that you can now handle spikes. So it's the idea is that you typically will sc uh, set your scale in terms of what we call request units based on the throughput that you need. But typically, in order for you to handle it, you'd actually have to do it to the maximum. Right, but that's actually more more costly. To help save you money, what we're saying is that no, set your RUs to basically the somewhere between the average and 75% of your actual load, and then the if you if and when you have spikes uh, in traffic, then we actually you can turn on and enable requests per minute, and it'll actually be able to handle that spike, okay, uh, uh, automatically for you, so you don't actually have to do anything to handle the spike in traffic. All right, and so what I'm going to show now is actually a slightly different demo. Okay, now I'm going to go ahead and go to my database here. Um, let's see here. I'm going back to the dashboard. I'm going to go ahead and connect to this. Let's see. Uh, here we go. Under collections, I click on scale. All right, so I'm going to choose one of my collections, and I'm going to, I'm going to note the, the performance characteristics of it. So meanwhile, as I'm waiting for the portal, oh, actually, it's here. Let's go. Here we go. So I'm going to hit Rainier. And so what I've done is I've set, I've got just a default setup where I can, I can set it to 2,500 RUs. Now, 2,500 RUs basically is um, a RU stands for request units, and so what you want performance, basically you're saying, um, when you're paying for RUs, which is uh, request units per second, it is one kilobyte read, okay, is one RU, and 3.667 um, RUs is one kilobyte write. So that's actually how you estimate 
performance you need because you basically figure out how, how fast of a read tra reads per second do you need in terms of one kilobyte si chunk sizes and how many how fast you need writes. Now, it is a different math, right? But the importance of this, and I'll show you this demo in a second, is that you don't actually have to figure out then how to set up clusters, how to set up servers, or anything else like that. Okay, so let me just dive into the demo, and then we'll, I'll explain what I mean by all this. Okay, so I've got a little quick uh, benchmarking tool right here. Okay, um, that is connected to uh, uh, this same Cosmos DB instance, and it's going to go and just simply try to do its writes. And so in this case, because it's set at 2,500 RUs per second. You'll notice here on the right side, it's trying to hit 2,500, or in some cases, it's actually able to go above it, so that's great. Uh, and on average, we're inserting somewhere between 250 to 240, uh, sorry, 240 to 250 writes per second. Okay, so this is great. So I got 240 to 250 writes per second at around 2,500 RUs. Okay. So I'm going to cancel that for now. Now I, I want to take into account of the fact that I need a lot faster performance, okay? So for me to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm just simply going to go to the portal. Again, you can do this um, using uh, programmatically through the .NET, Java, Python, or Node.js SDKs, but I'm going to just change that number. I'm going to go right from 2,500 RUs. I'm going to go jump right up to 100,000 RUs, and we can actually go much higher than that. These are the default settings. Uh, you just work with us, and we can actually give you million, two million, much higher throughput for that matter, okay? But let's just go ahead and save that. Now, you'll notice that it says they're scaling the collection right here, and in about two seconds, boom, it Okay, so in other words, I've just auto-scaled this thing. So now I've successfully scaled the collection. Okay, it took me longer to explain it than for it to actually happen. When I go back to the demo, same demo, I've done no other changes to the code. I'm just going to go ahead and rerun this test, and you'll notice that now I can try to access a, a, all 100,000 RUs. Instead of actually accessing somewhere between 240 to 250 writes per second, I've just massively jumped up to 67, 6800, 6900 writes per second. So in other words, a two second change to Cosmos DB has now allowed me to jump up from 2500, uh, 250 writes per second to, two, uh, to almost 7000 writes per second, just like that. And in fact, we might actually even be able to go higher than that the reason I say that is because if you look at the CPU, I'm starting to max out this box, okay? You'll notice that it's at the utilization is at 99 to 100%. And so I'm maxing everything out. And as soon as I finish uh, doing the writing that I have here, I cancel it. You'll notice that the, the CPU just drops just like that, okay? And so that's the quick call out that basically I did not have to manage partitions. I did not have to replicate anything. I did not have to... In, uh, um, turn on new boxes, put new routers in, plug in new network cables. I did none of that stuff. All I did is this, which is change the RUs from 2,500 to 100,000. Now I'm going to change it right back to 2,800, just like this. I'm going to click on Save. And again, in a matter of seconds, I've saved it. I now have the correct throughput that I want, which is 2,500. I rerun the test, and it'll go jump, and just like that, it'll drop right back down to about 240, 250 writes per second, okay? And so that's the call out, that this is the type of thing we're talking about. If you want truly elastic throughput, and you want to not need to manage the partitions, not need to manage the hardware associated with you want to be able to programmatically, or through the portal, tell us what performance you need, and in our case, because of the way Cosmos DB is designed, we can automatically give it to you within seconds of the request that you gave us. And uh, back to the portal real quick. Uh, I have not turned it on, but if you simply turn on the RUs per minutes, then basically you'll automatically be able to get uh, 10x, uh, up to 10x uh, uh, performance of spikes uh, through the system. Uh, and all you do is click on, save it, and then just like that, now you can actually handle spikes in your traffic as well, okay? Cool. So that's a, the, our concept of elastically scalable throughput, okay? So um, let's see. Now, uh, one final note on the SLA side of things, 99.9949% availability, okay? Uh, and like I said, we have financially backed SLAs. Low latency, consistency, and throughput are also covered by this. So not, it's not just availability, but we have four dimensions of, uh, of for us to where which we will give have financially backed SLAs to protect you. 
okay? And when we mean durable, we mean durable. So in other words, the underlying infrastructure of Cosmos DB is actually multiple replicas of the data. We have one primary and three replicas of your data. So that way, when you write it, we will automatically ensure that the data is replicated onto other nodes in the local region. So that way, if any of this data was to go offline or become corrupted, you actually have at minimum two other copies of the data, if not three, that you can actually piggyback off of to read online and in the interim as, as we repair that other replica, uh, you, you still have three replicas to hit. So this is the type of uh, this is the type of performance the type of performance that we can give you and this is the reason why we can provide SLAs to back it up. Another key important aspect of this is well-defined consistency models, okay? And so what I mean by this is that what a lot of folks who are used to and a lot of our competing technologies, are, they can give you strong, which is similar to the concept of a SQL Server, or they can give you eventual consistency, which means that you insert the data and eventually it'll be consistent across the all four replicas, okay? Strong means all four replicas will, will all act and be in agreement of the transaction that it just received before it sends an act back. In the area of uh, idea of eventually consistent, it means the primary uh, uh, for that particular insertion has acted and said, yes, we've acknowledged it, received it, and in the back end, we will go ahead and make sure the data is replicated to other systems. We actually have five of them. We have strong, bound to staleness, session, consistent prefects, and eventual. Most users actually use uh, session, uh, bound to staleness is basically strong, except that what's cool about that is that is that it's really needed from the standpoint of global replication. We can we actually will you actually specify what are the x number of operations or a t number of time that you're waiting in terms of between when the transaction made it to your central uh, your excuse me the right region where you wrote the file. Uh, sorry, wrote the uh, the document, and uh, the time and the operations behind in which we will then replicate the data to the other regions. Now, the reason we do this is not because we are trying to do it as fast as we can. The reason we say you're going to specify the number of operations or the uh, teen amount of time is because we have financial SLAs that back this up. So in other words, we we guarantee that 99.9 percent .9 of the 99 percent of the transactions that occur that are replicated across the globe will occur within the boundaries of this much time and or this much operations. And so again, we provide that right in, right into the system. So that way you can have predictable performance, not just in your local region, but you have predictable performance globally, okay? And so now the one cool thing that we announced as part of Build this year is that we are a multi-model, multi-API service. Well, multi-API we already were, but multi-model service. And so the context is that we are first party uh, and popular third party OSS APIs to connect to Cosmos DB. Um, you want to talk to us within the context of key value, document, calmer, graph, uh, you're good to go. There are APIs for document DB, which is SQL and JavaScript, for MongoDB, for table, and for graph, such as using the uh, as using Apache Tinkerpop Gremlin. Okay, we support. Uh, a, lo a, a lot of different programming languages as noted, and we are continually adding new APIs. So that way, your focus is not then even on do I have to change my API service layer, that you can actually use your existing API service layer uh, that you're used to doing, and you can still interact with us anyways. And so we're, we're trying to make things significantly easier for developers to basically work with our system. And so how, the reason we can do all this is, uh, we, I sort of hinted that in the beginning, is that there's no schema there's, or index migration. It, it's a highly write optimized database engine that can work across all these different data models that I mentioned in the previous slide because the underlying uh, fundamental that, uh, that is Cosmos DB is JSON. And we are able to develop multiple models uh, using that context, right? Um, we have, 
multiple different indexes because of that, uh, hash range and geospatial, it's fully resource government, and basically you, in terms of index transformations, we have both online and in situ. So we do a lot of this stuff automatically for you as well. You can update and modify the indexes if you want within Cosmos DB, but out of the gate, the defaults are usually good enough for a lot of scenarios. So that way you don't actually even have to modify the indexes. We just, again, automatically do this stuff for you. Uh, another important aspect is that because of our, our how aggressive we are to building this pro this awesome product, you know, yes, we're the industry's first globally distributed multi-model database service. But another really important aspect is that we are significantly cheaper than competing products, significantly cheaper than Dynamo, Cassandra, Cloud Spanner, uh, MongoDB. Um, we actually have a really great TCO paper um, uh, that you know ping us, and we'll send it to your way that explains the costs uh, associated with running these type of systems. Right? Um, we're multi-tenant. We have throughput isolation, and what it boils down to is then the vast majority of your dev and ops expenses pretty much are non-existent at this point because we take care of that stuff for you, okay? And so now I'm gonna go ahead and talk about the recent updates and roadmaps, okay? And so some pretty cool stuff. The first thing is the table API. So people often are used to this concept of big table. Well, yes, we have this table API, and right now, uh, initially people were using Azure Table Storage. So we, as part of Cosmos DB, are providing a premium experience for Azure Table Storage. So in other words, you have your table um, EDM model, that's great, but we actually will provide secondary indices provide dedicated throughput, low latency, and global distribution for table storage customers. We're gonna be backwards compatible to existing table SDKs. Uh, we're in preview mode right now, so we're uh, quickly working through all the different issues uh, that, uh, to ensure the backwards compatibility. Um, basically, our roadmap is that we're going to update this for for standard tables and we're and will be definitely optimized for storage and then that way you have that seamless migration to Cosmos DB. So lots of really cool stuff on the table front right from the get-go. Okay, another really fun and cool aspect is the Graph API. So in other words, we are working with, uh, our first foray is with, current foray, excuse me, is support with Apache, Tinkerpop, and Gremlin. Okay, so the, the one of the primary standards, OSS standards for Graph is t Tinkerpop. And so we'll go ahead and uh, when you spin up a graph container within Cosmos DB, you are able to run Gremlin queries directly against your system. This is great for social networks, for recommendations, logistics, IoT. And just like everything else that's Cosmos DB, it's globally distributed, horizontally, horizontally scalable graphs. And so, um, and on top of that, OSS friendly. So you got the combination of all of the above, and it's a pretty cool system that we've got here. And so I, I implore you guys to try it out. Uh, I'm actually gonna show you a pseudo demo of that uh, shortly as well. So just to let you know that, uh, of how all this works. But this is some pretty cool stuff. Another cool thing, so we've already uh, publicly previewed the Spark connector for Cosmos DB. Um, this allows you to connect Spark directly to Cosmos DB as an import, as far as an input or output sync. Uh, you can read or write massive amounts of data in parallel, native integration with Spark SQL. Um, we even we have the RDD and data frame based connectors, but you know most of the time people are working with the data frame data sets because that allows you to interact with the machine learning libraries, the structured streaming libraries, the graph frames, things of that nature. Um, the key important aspect is that it, when you go from Spark to Cosmos DB, there's a direct mapping between the Spark workers and the Cosmos DB data partition. So you can have highly parallel throughput between a distributed compute engine, in this case Apache Spark, and with a distributed storage engine, which is Cosmos DB. Because uh, Spark is then able to natively leverage Cosmos DB indexes, that means we have push down predicates that will filter the data that goes from Cosmos DB into Spark or vice versa, so that way it'll be even faster because we're filtering the amount of data that comes across the wire. 
Uh, we will be GA uh, this uh, in fact. In fact, basically this half of the, this half of the calendar year, uh, and we're rapidly getting to that point where we're feeling comfortable uh, announcing it. We're probably going to probably targeting around September. For October, but we'll we'll have a firmer date uh, as the as the time progresses. Okay. Uh, important aspects for any of your enterprise customers: security and compliance. So we're always encrypted at rest and in motion. We hi have highly scalable role level authorization, IP firewalls. Uh, we are already ISO, EUMC, HIPAA, and PCI certified. We actually. Uh, just got, uh, we are SOC 1, SOC 2, FedRAMP, IRS, UK official, autocomplete. We should receive the certifications of this very soon, in, uh, uh, basically in, in the second half of this year. In fact, SOC 1 and SOC 2 are now certified, we are now certified. We're about to uh, make those announcements as well. So even after everything I just said about the cool functionality, we, we understand it's necessary to secure and be compliant to have understand GRC. This has been built into the into Cosmos DB from the ground up, right from the get go. And so, some cool examples of who uses uh, Cosmos DB. So I'm going to just go through these real quick. But uh, one uh, awesome example is Skype. It powers the one million searches per second of conversation data. Okay, uh, and it's just the metadata. So we, in other words, we know what from one location to what location, which regions are hot. So that way, Skype can know how to uh, um, increase the service or the the network uh, uh, it needs to provide for those regions. Uh, the key benefits and the reason why they're using Cosmos DB is because of that fast ingestion of uh, message data, of group chats, and then also enabling real-time queries over those messages and group conversations. Okay, so th that's one cool example. Another cool example is Toyota. You know, their their connected car push is via Azure Cosmos DB. So it's almost like a typical IoT style uh, way of looking at things. They um, uh, they can scale elastically uh, elasti uh, without the operational overhead of Mongo because that's originally where they came. Uh, were originally were thinking of doing. Uh, they're performing fast queries over these events, and they uh, uh, they perform stage migrations via MongoDB API. So they can still use their all their original code that was able to connect through Mongo, and they had no problem actually still ca talking to Cosmos DB anyways. Another great example is Jet.com. They Black Friday sales, and we were there with them. We could handle the sheer volume of uh, uh, of data of events that came through because of Black Friday. Um, the 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 busiest uh, sale uh, sales day um, um, shopping day in the United States. Uh, we provided them elastically uh, elastic scalability from one to ten million requests per second. Uh, we improved the reliability, uh, faster order processing uh, than um, than their previous OSS solution. And the other key aspect for them, which is what they enjoyed the most, is that the reduced development time and the reduced operational overhead to, to be able to do all of this. So this is pretty cool that they're actually that Jet.com uh, was able to go ahead and make use of Cosmos DB to, uh, in this fashion. Uh, for those who are gamers, the Walking Dead game, so by Next Games, they went ahead and in order to be able to scale uh, for the millions of users for the number one free iOS game, okay, we're talking a billion daily queries, a million peak active users, and they needed global distribution, and they used uh, uh, because they're uh, they have we have features like automatic indexing and also change feed. You know, hey, they're able to also build real time leaderboards, so things of that nature that they need that flexibility, scalability, and speed. Again, Cosmos DB provided them that capability. And so, in summary, uh, the, the callouts for us are things of global distribution, elastic scale out, uh, consistency models, uh, comprehensive SLAs, and I'm just trying to get through it, these different things. Multi-model APIs, so that way you can hit use JavaScript, SQL, Mongo, Gremlin, tables uh, to hit the different models that we have in terms of key value, column family, documents, and graph. Lots of good stuff, and so this is what Cosmos DB is. And the the final little demo that I wanted to show you guys is actually a Spark to Cosmos DB. And so when f folks who want to then also do data science against all of this data, instead of actually trying to transform that data, 
uh, into some other flatter form before you before you can actually read the data. Let's use the fast performance of Cosmos DB. Let's go ahead and use the um, the, the the power distributed compute power of Spark and put them together. And so what we have here is actually a notebook that's actually available. Oh, sorry, not that one. Um, this one that's actually available in uh, right on the um, uh, Spark Connector GitHub page. That you, so in other words, you can download and use it. And so the the quick context is that this is the Spark to Cosmos DB connector. We can let the Spark will go ahead and talk to Cosmos DB, get the, the routing tables that tell us where your data lies in which data partitions and such that the worker nodes of Spark are able to connect directly to the data partitions of Cosmos DB. Being able to do that, once we go ahead and initialize that, basically all of this stuff allows me to ultimately, this, is, this code is it. I basically go ahead and specify my endpoint, which is the Doctor Who database you found, the master key, which database, what are my preferred regions, my collection, and now that I've done that, I'm able to create a, a, a data frame. And so in this case, this COL as a collection, that's a data frame for me to go ahead and access. And then from this point onwards, I am sending good old fashioned Spark SQL queries. So in other words, select these uh, elements from the collection. Now it looks like good old fashioned SQL statements that you're accessing the data. And that's exactly it. So now I'm writing SQL statements to access my uh, uh, Cosmos DB data. The, the, this allows me to do distributed aggregation. So it's not just like top 100. It's not just counts like this one here, okay? It's things like group by statements, okay, which we have here. Um, oh, it wasn't running, so let me go run that. So for example, I want to go ahead and understand by destination where flights are leaving from uh, Seattle, which airports have the most delays, okay? So there's originally from Seattle, What which ones have the most delays? Here we go, uh, San Francisco, Denver, Chicago, O'Hare, and you can even go ahead and because we're using uh, HC Insight and the Jupyter Notebook service that's running Spark, now I'm actually able to graphically visualize this data as well. And so you can do these aggregations, these distinct queries, uh, um, uh, even, oh, I, I forget to, forgot to run this one, basically median delays. So in other words, a, a distributed median is actually a really hard thing to calculate, but because you've got Cosmos DB that can give you guaranteed throughput of the data, I can go ahead and just create a quick area graph of my median delays of all flights originating from Seattle to each and every one of these airports, just like this, okay? And so um, there's also lots of other cool stuff inside here. And so I, uh, if you have any questions, please ask now, or you can even ask later on. Uh, my email alias is denny.lee at microsoft.com. But we've got a lot of cool stuff here, and um, we'd love to help uh, and uh, you guys to, to basically quickly build your applications uh, to support, well, these modern applications that, we, uh, th uh, that we're trying to build these days. Thank you very much, Danny. It was really, really interesting. Actually, we have a question here that's uh, about uh, storing images in uh, Azure Cosmos DB. Is that possible? And if yes, um, do you have any recommendation or there is any limitation that some anyone should be aware of? So we don't store directly within Cosmos DB, but, and here's the big but, uh, what we do is we actually have a, a concept called attachments. And so what happens is when you work with Cosmos DB, you can enable attachments. The, uh, the, when you enable attachments, basically the images or blobs that you're referring to will actually be attached into blob storage, but there will be a metadata point, pointer that, that Cosmos DB has, so that way it can easily access that image and send it back to you. So yes, we have that. Okay, capability. okay got it. Um, and then I have a couple of questions that I just pointed out. Uh, um, so you mentioned that rights, or actually what, I, what I was uh, visible in the portal is that rights uh, go to a very specific region. Is that right? Uh, I'm sorry, could you say that? Uh, ask yeah, the question so, again. Yeah, right. Uh, uh, are sent to a very specific region, right? So you have oh, that a, is correct. Yes, yes. So, right. uh, yeah, so this ahead, is, do, uh, is done automatically. So even if I specify all the region, uh, as you shown before, uh, in the in the array of my preferred region, when I try to read the uh, sorry, when I try to write something, it's automatically everything is automatically sent to that region, right? 
That is correct, yes. Okay, that's, that's uh, interesting. Now we have uh, another question here. Um, oh, that's uh, interesting. So, i uh, just read the uh, um, question to you. With the global availability of Cosmos DB, is possible to configure data sovereignty at the document row or key value level? Okay, so there's actually a lot of different meanings to data so sovereignty. So let, let's be very specific, okay? Um, you tip, when you globally replicate data, it's done at the um, it's done at the database level, okay? Uh, it's not done at the collection level, it's done at the database level. So typically if you need data to be replicated uh, for specific scenarios, typically we'll advise to have separate databases so that way you will only replicate data, the only data that you want. So then related to that, for example, if I have data sitting in in the EU, right? Let's just say it's sitting in England, or, well, maybe not in England in this case. Let's say it's France and Netherlands, okay? <laughs> right. Yeah. Then, yeah, like in this case, you're allowed replicating the data between France and Netherlands, but you certainly cannot replicate the data from Netherlands to the U.S., okay? So yeah. then what we do is you say, no, you set up global replication, so you ensure that that database is only replicating between those regions, You and you just do not specify, cannot be not allowed to specify to include U.S., we also have specific sovereignty scenarios, and that's why I'm saying like there's multiple uh, uh, layers of the onion here, right? So, for example, Germany and China have their own specific regions, so they won't allow global replication um, because they say, no, it has to only stay in that region. So if you work with those particular environments, they, they can't be globally replicated because of the nature of what that stuff is and all the uh, uh, sovereignty issues associated with that. By the same token, in the case of our government data centers, uh, you can re replicate data between the different government data centers. So th those are obviously separate from the public ones, so you can't obviously uh, replicate data from public to government or vice versa. By the same token, within the government regions, you can replicate data between them. So it, there are multiple approaches to this particular issue, but yes, uh, long story short, the, you know, we, we follow all the sovereignty and uh, compliance laws. Uh, per each of the regions that we're in, and that's the reason why, you know, uh, that uh, one of the last slides I have, we were very careful to call out. We have a lot of the certifications already. We're, in other words, we're already certified, and we're already autocomplete for the last set of ones to basically say, yeah, yeah, we've pretty much got every single certification that most people would care about. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's uh, completely answered the question. So I have other uh, question coming. So one is about the limitation, uh, about uh, about the limitation of the data size that can be stored. There are any specific limitation on the data that can be indexed, for example? Uh, is the data compressed in some way when it's stored? So people are interested about limitation that they will uh, probably face at some point, or maybe not. Huh? So, oh yeah. So, so, so coming from a SQL Server perspective, I can tell you up front, like you know, if you need a general engine that's great at super great at aggregation, super great at you know, like including things like Python integration and R integration and, and uh, UDFs, and you do not have a system that requires guaranteed throughput and you do not have a system that uh, requires scalable size because you're able to, you, you, you know, everything is pretty much fit and fiddle, mm -hmm. I would not necessarily say go ahead and do all this because after all there's a different paradigm in thinking, right? We're not thinking in terms of a SQL Server database or a SQL Server box anymore. We're thinking in terms of what is your RU count, right? And this sure. is the reason why we differentiate between like when we marketing has us do these tags like you know modern applications right and the reason why is because yeah like when you're playing a game like well, let's just say the concept of modern applications when you're playing a game where you're doing recommendations when you're um doing iot type scenarios yeah. for example right you don't you you don't know what capacity you need you you don't know these things there isn't a um a red book or a, a, a playbook for you to work with that says, okay, well, I'm going to need uh, a Clarion with, you know, 48 core or like, five, sure. you know, 8 core SQL Server uh, with only with 128 gigabytes of RAM, right? You're, you're not going to have that scenario. And so if you're able to fit in that scenario comfortably, 
I'm still a fan of SQL Server, right? It's not like I'm trying to knock SQL Server. Quite the opposite. I'm a fan of SQL Server. In, in this case, it's, it's more, much more about like when you start going into the, these other type of scenarios where, which very much say, no, no, I am worried about latency and throughput. I am worried about writes. I am worried about that. I need to de determine uh, 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 what I, I can't worry about the partition management. What I but what I can worry about are things like what's the best partition key. Well, then yes, Cosmos DB is perfect for those situations. And and so I, I guess I, I'm trying my best to say what are our limits because in a lot of ways from from a modern apps perspective, there aren't that many limits per se, but by the same token, mm -hmm. you know, I want to sort of phrase it, I, so that's why I sort of phrase it in a way of like, no, like if you've got existing applications, it may not actually make sense at all to, to convert over. What, what we're really gunning for it and what we're there for is because you've got these newer problems that you got to solve and we're going to get, well, that's why we've designed Cosmos DB the way we have. Sure. But so let's say that I have uh, one megabytes uh, JSON document or let's say even 10, 10 gigabytes JSON document. I can still store it into Cosmos without any problem? Yeah, you absolutely can. I mean, this is one of those cases, uh, like if you got 10 gigabytes of data, in fact, we actually have what we call single partition collections. And literally, a single partition collection is up to 10 gigabytes of space, uh, oh. uh, up to 10,000 RUs. Uh, basically, it's about $24 a month. For this and so oh, everything's okay. maintained. Oh, US in this case, everything's maintained for you. You get all you get all the features that uh, that I just talked about. You can go down to that level if you wanted to. Yes. Yeah, got it. And last question, and try to summarize uh, all uh, other stuff uh, is uh, so you also mentioned that basically Azure Cosmos work uh, or can be seen as a columnar database, right? Uh, I'm right, correct? That's correct, yes. Okay, so columnar database are known to be fast in aggregating data. So right. my question here is, if I'm aggregating data over like 100 gigabytes of uh, document, uh, the SLA are still in place, so Cosmos will still answer to me in like uh, 10 milliseconds, even if I'm aggregating that much data? Ah, gotcha. So, a fair question. No, in the case of aggregations, it's the where the where the SLA is kicking in is specifically from the scenario of how to within 10 milliseconds of getting the document to the engine to perform the aggregation. As okay, opposed, got it. As Makes opposed sense, to the, the aggregation. Yeah. Now, right now, natively within Cosmos DB, we already have some min, max, average account, right? So we already have those things. We're rapidly working on more things, and so we're adding more and more aggregations to it, adding a column store into it, but these are roadmap things, so I want to be very uh, sure. you know, clear and upfront about it. And that's also part of the reason why I call out Spark in this case, because um, for some of these larger enterprises have decided that, no, no, I need to do massively high-scale yeah, yeah. aggregations, then often what we say is, well, then no problem. Plug Spark into it, and then party hardy. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, sure. Well, that's, that's it's very interesting, a really uh, interesting roadmap. Okay, that's cool. I think uh, it's all. All the questions should be answered. Um, so thank you very much. It was really interesting, and I think uh, uh, many people will start definitely to look at it because it's uh, it's amazing. So that's interesting. Absolutely. Oh, awesome. Well, hey, thanks very much yeah. for the timer. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much for presenting. I'm sure I will ask you in future to do another session uh, uh, because I'm sure that people will love it. So just be prepared. <laughs> always glad to do it, David. Always glad to okay. do it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Have a nice day. All right. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.